thank and praise God for His grace that has been enabling all of us to continue to study the Word of God. And uh, through uh, Paul's letter to Timothy, you know, we could see a different you know, facets or different aspects of faith. And today, from today, we will begin the study of uh, Paul's epistle uh, to Titus. And as I've said in the you know the uh, very beginning of our uh, uh, study of uh, Paul's epistle to Timothy. Now, Paul sends Timothy and Titus to two, two different places with the responsibility. Like Timothy was sent to Ephesus and Titus was sent to Crete. Now, we see that in the, this letter itself, this epistle itself. And uh, the, the, the major responsibility you know, that Apostle Paul had entrusted to Timothy and to Titus when he sent them to Ephesus and Crete was you know, to set right the church of God. Uh, Timothy is sent there. Uh, when we read the letter of uh, to Titus, we understand that actually Paul, Titus is left there. You know that we, so we can understand that Titus was already there. You know when Apostle Paul was there and he had left him when Apostle Paul had left that place uh, uh, to do to do his ministry to, to accomplish you know, the responsibility that is entrusted to him. And we will be you know studying these uh, the three chapters. You know it's a very small epistle, but it has very strong and very you know meaningful and uh, truths that we all need to learn and we will be focusing on these three chapters of Paul's letter to Titus on good works so I think it's, it's a beautiful uh, you know a lesson because you know we studied about faith in uh, Timothy and in Titus we'll be read, studying about good works in fact you know if you read these three chapters very often quite often you would actually would find those you know the verses uh, the focus on uh, good works, like in one sixteen, you know, the first, last chapter, last verse of the first chapter talks about good work, and the same time, you, uh, if you turn to the second chapter, it talks about uh, in the sixth verse talk about uh, talks about good works, the fourteenth verse talks about good deeds, the third chapter begins with good work, and uh, you know the uh, the eighth verse of the third chapter talks about good works. And the 14th verse of the third chapter also talks about good works. You see a lot of, you know, uh, reference to good works in these uh, three chapters. Uh, the reason is, you know, when Paul is actually you know, sending Titus to set right the church of God there, uh, the leadership and the believers, he is focusing on the faith and good works here. So this is my prayer that as we, you know, study these this uh, epistle, that the Lord will, you know, speak to us. And, uh, you know, one thing, you know, that I always enjoy about you know, reading and studying the word of God is God's word is a treasure. And it, it's such a treasure that the, the more, you, you know, deeper you dig and you dig and dig, you know, you find more treasure. You know, it's, it's, it's a never ending treasure. No, that's always such a delight. No, it's a joy going into the word of God. That's one. And number two, it's not only a treasure that we enjoy. It's also, it, it's the truth, you know, by which you and I are called to live by. Man, now that's what I always say. You know, it's a treasure that we need to dig deeper. It's the truth, you know, by which you and I are called to believe, you know, to called to live. And thirdly, it is this, it is the word of God, you know, that will enable you and me to have a testimonial life. You know, this is applicable to all of the word of God. And uh, when we go through tests, when we go through trials, you know, this word of God. And fourthly, you know, in during the test and trials, it is this word of God that will strengthen us to move forward. Amen. The promises of God, you know, on which we can completely rely upon. You know, I encourage all of all of you, uh, you know, to continue to study the word of God. And, uh, you know, as you as you see, you know, we'll start uh, meditating this uh, Paul's letter to Titus, you will see the unfolding of, you know, God's greater truths. And I would just, you know, be giving you a, a kind of a framework. And, uh, you know, I really, you know, ask uh, and encourage all of you to dig deeper, you know, to study more. Uh, so that it will be truly, you know, helpful to your lives. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, we'll be looking at the uh, Paul's epistles, epistle to Titus and the overall theme of good works. And let me read a verse to begin with. If you, if you read you know, Paul's letter to Ephesians, uh, Paul's uh, letter to Ephesians chapter 2, words 8 to 10. And I'm reading from NRSV, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, words 8 to 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. 
it is the gift of god not the result of works so that no one may boast for we are what he has made us created in christ jesus for good works which god prepared beforehand to be our way of life you know so what do we actually you know see here is you know, paul talking about how you and i are been saved you know by grace through faith and he says it is it is a gift of god and not the result of our works so you all we all understand this you know this the basic uh, truth that our salvation is not because of our works it's because of the work of jesus on the cross uh, and it is by his grace and through faith you and i are saved you have received the salvation but then you know it goes on to say goes on to say in the 10th verse for we are what he has made us created in christ jesus for good works you know that is you and i are not saved by good works but you and i are saved for good works you know uh, if if you have your bibles you can underline there for good works you now you and i are not saved by good works but for good works it's it's by by grace of jesus christ by grace of god and through faith by the work that jesus done on the cross is what you and i have saved but for what it says for good works so good works follows our salvation good works follows our faith in christ and 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 see the verse which god prepared beforehand to be our way of life amen you know so what does paul say that you have been saved why for certain good works which god has already prepared beforehand to be our way of life you know so this 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 good works is a way of life and it's a works of our life and with that understanding i would like to come to you know paul's letter to titus and uh, through these letters you know i believe that you no know, god will speak to us to understand you know the this this good works what is good works are and at the same time prepare us you know so that these good works may be done through your life and my life you met that this is my wish and prayer that the lord will not only speak to us lord not only inspire us but god will use us you know in those good works which he has prepared before and for all of us who were as part of the study who were as listening to it to this message as you know for all of us may the lord's name be glorified let me let us come back come to the chapter 1 of uh, paul's letter to titus and we will study this first chapter you know in the topic of fit for good work i will study this in the title of fit for good work so what are we going to study and see in this first chapter is like how does god make us fit or how does god prepare us you know for this good work let me read a verse to begin with chapter 1 and verse 16 the last words of uh, the first chapter of titus they profess to know god but they deny him by their actions they are detestable disobedient unfit for any good work you know the, the end of the first chapter it talks about those people whom uh, paul says writes to titus and says they profess to know god that is they confess or they say they declare you know that they know god but they deny him by their actions but their actions do not reflect their knowledge their actions do not reflect their faith their works that does not does not reflect their belief so and, it, and he says they are detestable disobedient and it says unfit another translation says they disqualified you know they detestable detestable disobedient and disqualified for any good work so in this chapter you know in the first chapter we will try and understand how does god make us fit for good work you know not unfit not to be disqualified but to be fit for good work okay so you know uh, as we read in this you know this words the 16th verse it, it talks about you know the people who are unfit for any good work so we'll be we'll try and understand how does god make us fit for any any good work or you know as i as, uh, as i was saying you know that say for example if somebody wants to excel in uh, in sports or in athletics you know what will they do or even you know would want to have a healthy life you know what would they do they would you know exercise you know they would make themselves fit and fine you know fit and healthy 
Why? So that, you know, they'll have the necessary physical strength to do that, you know, to compete, uh, to, you know, to be qualified, you know, e even to be qualified, isn't it, in sport? You need to have a, you need to have the required fitness. In the same way, in, in a spiritual life, if we need to be fit enough to, you know, to be, uh, to partake, you know, in the, in the good, good works that God has already, you know, prepared beforehand for you and I to be part of, we need to uh, understand certain spiritual truths. And in this first chapter, I would like to show, you know, three uh, aspects or three truths in the very first place. You know, uh, as I said, you know, that's God's word is a treasure and the, we can dig deeper and deeper and understand more of it. Uh, but as, as I said in the beginning also, I would just give you certain hints, certain frameworks so that you can understand it. You, you can take time to know, learn, understand more. Now, this is what we're going to do. We're going to look at, you know, three of, of things that God has, you know, it's, it's an identity that God has kept for you and me. So let me, you know, again, again, you know, come back to what I said in the beginning. You know, you and I are not, you know, saved by our works, by our good works. You and I are saved by the works of Jesus, by grace through faith. Okay, understand that. Number two is, why? For good works. So this good works follows our salvation. Now, when we, when we have to, you know, uh, be part, partake in this good works that God has prepared beforehand, you and I should never forget that our identity in Christ is a renewed identity. That is, you and I are not the same person whom we used to be, isn't it? You know, before Christ, our identity was different. But now in Christ, after salvation, being born again, our identity is in Christ and our identity in Christ is reflected in different ways. And that is what I'm going to you know, show today. Three identities you know, that God has given you and me because of the salvation and how as we understand these, you know, these identity, as we understand these truths, you know, what happens is that the result, the result is you and I will have a different life. Our life will, will be so different. Our life will be in line with, you know, in line with God, in line with Christ, in line with this new identity that we will automatically, you know, we will become partakers of the good work that God has prepared beforehand. You know, I, I really, you know, I pray that the Holy Spirit will help us to understand these truths, not only understand these truths, but to apply it into our lives, you know, so that those good work that God has prepared beforehand will be, you know, done through your life and my life on a daily basis. Amen. May the Lord, you know, speak to us. So there's three, three aspects of the three identities that I said. The first is, you know, Paul talks about you and I has God's elect. You know, the first identity that uh, Paul brings here in the first chapter is he talks about being God's elect. That is being chosen by God. Read the, let me read the first words in NRSV. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that is in accordance with godliness in the hope of eternal life that God who never lies promised before the ages began. In due time, I revealed his word through the proclamation with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior, to Titus, my loyal child in the faith we share, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. So here, you know, Paul begins his letter and he calls, he gives this identity to you and me, to to the believers, to the children of God. What is the identity? He says, for the sake of the faith of God's elect. You know, this is what he says. The identity is God's elect. What does this mean? This God's elect is to be chosen by God, to be elected by God. You know, what a great privilege is this. You know, many a times, you know, this is what, you know, makes me, you know, to bubble with joy, to think that, Lord, I am not worthy. You know, I am not better than someone in this world, but still you chose me, but still you elected me. You know, what a, what a great privilege this is, my dear brothers and sisters. You know, that is what, you know, he begins saying, you know, you are a God's elect. You're chosen by God. You know, when we understand this truth of God's election, and you understand this, this truth of being chosen by God, 
you know our it, it it begins to reflect in our life in a different way so i'm going to show you know two areas of life that you know comes when we understand that you and i are god's elect you know let me quickly take you to those those uh, part the, the you know, those aspects number one is you know this this because you and i are god's elect how did we you know because you you and i have become god's elect chosen by god we you and i have this hope of eternal life number one you and i have this hope of eternal life number two it reflects in our godly life you know let me break it down number see look at the verse 2 which i already read look at verse 2 in the first verse he said for the sake of the faith of the gods are like and the knowledge of the truth that is in accordance with godliness second verse is in the hope of eternal life the god who never lies promised before the ages began okay what is this you know this this life that you and i have received through christ you know the salvation that you and i have received through christ this new identity that you and i have received through christ has given us a hope of a eternal life so so when you understand that i am i am a god so like when you understand that i am chosen by god we should never forget this you know this perspective of eternal life that is you and i are called to live our life in the perspective of eternity so what does it actually it means it means that our life is not going to end in this world but my life is going to continue you know forever into eternity so what i do right now is going to affect my eternity so the choices that i make you know the lifestyle that i live you know the works that i do you know the words that i speak you know everything you know the decisions that i make all of it you know is going to affect my eternity you know where am i going to be in eternity with who am i going to spend my eternity and number 2 when i when i live with this eternal life in my perspective you know in my uh, in my thinking what happens is naturally my life will also will change you know i i i don't live you know for temporal things but rather i begin to prioritize eternal things it is no more the material things that actually matter but this eternity is what will always will matter you know so i would not be interested you know that's why you know that's why god said christ jesus said to his disciples you know i'm i'm going why am i going i'm going there to prepare you know a house for you to prepare rooms for you there are many rooms in heaven so when i when i look at that you know i wouldn't be really bothered what i have here i don't have whatever god has given praise be to god so my life will completely you know have that perspective so this identity of god's elect you know reflects in my life being lived you know lived by the perspective of eternal life that is the beginning and number 2 is it's also will reflect on my godly life because you know look at uh, words uh, words 2 you know let me read that in nlt new living translation no, sorry words 1 uh, verse 1 it says this letter is from paul i'm reading from nlt this letter is from paul a slave of god and an apostle of jesus christ i have been sent to proclaim faith to those uh, god has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives okay so number 2 is eternal life is the beginning and that's how i continue to live my life because i am chosen by god i am a god's elect and uh, you know as i said that reflects in my lifestyle and my choices my decisions and my actions in my words everything and number 2 not only that it's i am called to live a godly life because i am a god's elect i'm called to live a godly life that is what this is what will make me fit for the good work and it is in that perspective was studying and i wanted to look have a closer look at this words you know nlt puts it very beautiful let me read the words again i have been sent to proclaim faith to those god has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives so how can how can you and i be fit for a god uh, fit for any good work it is you know by living a godly life why am i living a godly life because i am a god select i am chosen by god i have a new identity in christ how can i live a godly life it is 
by the truth that shows me how to live the godly life. And where do I find this truth? This truth are in the word of God. What a beautiful revelation is this, isn't it? That's what, you know, Paul is saying to Titus. What is he saying? That God has chosen them, these believers, wise, and to teach them what? To know the truth that shows them how to live a God life. So what does it mean? You and I cannot live a godly life apart from the word of God, apart from the truth of God's word, the revelation of God's word. So every day I need, you know, this manna, I need this word of God. You know, I need this truth so that I can live a godly life. You know, that's what Jesus said to his disciples. You know, you are clean even now because of the words that I have spoken to you, the words that I have given to you. You know, the word, it cleanses us. He cleansed us by his blood for a salvation. And he continues to cleanse us by his word for sanctification. You know, his blood cleanses us so that we may have that assurance of the eternal life, the salvation. And his word continues to cleanse us for our sanctification, amen, for a godly life. Uh, you know, so may the Lord help you and me to prioritize, you know, to read, to meditate, and to obey the word of God that you and I may not only know those truths, you know, but those truths of the word of God may result in our godly life. When, when that results in our godly life, what happens? You know, our life gets fit for the good work to be accomplished which God has prepared beforehand. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, what a, what a wonderful, you know, truth this is. What a wonderful revelation is this. So number one is understanding that you and I are God's elect, chosen by God. We have a new identity. And under this understanding is where we begin to live and prioritize and take decisions and make choices that have eternal life in perspective. And we, we live our life you know, in a, in a, as a godly life by living by the truth of the word of God on a daily basis, by studying the word, by, by committing ourselves to the word of God. May the Lord not only help us to understand this, but to apply it in, to our lives and to, you know, teach others. Uh, let me, you know, take you to the second aspect, the second identity. The first identity, as I shared, it's about God's like The second identity is where, you know, Paul writes to Titus, this is about being a God's steward. And it talks about a God's steward. L look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. Uh, read, read it with me. I'm reading it from NRSV. For a bishop has God's steward must be blameless. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or addicted to wine or violent or greedy for gain. Okay, so number two, the the identity that he gives us, God's steward. You know, sometimes you may wonder, is it only meant for bishops? Is it not meant for me? Some translations, you know, the translation says it's for, God, for an elder. Others say church leader. You know, as I have been saying in uh, all the, you know, the, even from the meditation of uh, uh, Timothy, that you and I are, you know, God's leaders, you know, uh, you and I have an influence wherever we are, and you and I are called to be godly leaders there. And these truths are applicable to every believer who has, you know, the New Testament where it talks about the priesthood of all believers. You and I are, you know, these truths are applicable to us. So what is the point that I want to make here is, number two is when we, we need to understand that we are God's steward. You know, who is the steward? A steward is a one to whom the master has entrusted a responsibility. A steward, he understands that I am not the owner. I am not the master. That is a master. And he has entrusted unto me. He is that, that person is a steward. And what does he also he understand? And what does he also he do is he knows that I need to give an account for everything that I have received from the master. You know, that's why, you know, in the uh, Gospels, we read, you know, certain several uh, parables related to stewardship, where, you know, Jesus talks about where, you know, a, a person, when he goes uh, to a far land and he calls his servants and he entrusts them talents, you know, in the, in, in the parable of talents also, you know, you can see the principle of stewardship there, you know, where uh, he entrusts talents and he comes back and asks an account. 
another parable where he talks about you know the uh, uh, you know the master where he entrusts uh, uh, certain responsibilities and he forgives you know and then uh, uh, the, the the servant who was forgiven he doesn't forgive another person there also you can see a stewardship principle so i'm not getting into all of that you know that's another part but what i'm going to focus today is in the context of first chapter of titus when you and i understand the principle that our identity of being a god steward how does it reflect in our life and the, you know when 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 you understand that you know it affects our life what happens is it will enable us to be fit for the good work that god has prepared for us beforehand so let me focus on that the two things that i want to show under being the god steward number one is it talks about a blameless life and number two it talks about a wise and just life uh, if you read from words 5 to 8 you actually we can understand these principles and i'm going to you know read this from nlt new living translation let me read it you know slowly uh, from nlt titus chapter 1 and verse 5 to 8 i'm reading from nlt i left you on the island of crete so you could complete our work there and appoint elders in each town as i instructed you an elder must live a blameless life he must be faithful to his wife and his children must be believers who don't have a reputation for being wild or rebellious a church leader is a manager of god's household so he must live a blameless life he must not be arrogant or quick tempered he must not be a heavy drinker violent or dishonest with money rather he must enjoy having guests in his home and he must love what is good he must live wisely and be just he must live a devout and a disciplined life what do we see there number one is when i understand that i am a god's steward that god has entrusted certain things to me i urge or i commit myself to live a blameless life and you know in fact he gives a list of things in which we and i need to be found blameless number one he talks about being faithful in marriage he must be faithful to his wife he talks about faithful in marriage and family you know it's a first the first aspect is about a family he talks about that his children must be believers who don't have a reputation for being wild or rebellious what does it mean that how do we you know how do we bring up our children you know to be believers this is where you know uh, we need to understand that you know children you know, truly you know they they may obey or may not obey what we say but when we live and show our lives it will truly have an effect on them isn't it you know i i believe that you would agree with me you know when we do certain things they would you know they would actually know would, would follow that maybe not immediately but as they keep observing our lives you know as they keep seeing this from our from our lives that becomes you know a a a model for them to follow as talks about faithfulness in you know in our in our uh, in our marital relationships he talks about how do we bring up our children and then he talks about you know look at the seventh words he talks about our you know our character it says not not to be arrogant or not to be quick tempered not to get angry immediately not a, not a drunk not violent not greedy not dishonest with money all these are principles of having a blameless life a question may you know come up in your mind is it possible to live a 100% blameless life you know i would say no nobody can but the point is it's not about you know how perfect i am no the point is do i try to live a blameless life do i strive to live a blameless life so that is what the, the heart is what god is you know looking at in fact when you and i have that heart you and i have that will he will give us the way amen when you and i have that heart he will give us that enablement to live a blameless life you know it is not possible you know to actually you know uh, to be blameless in everything you know in all ways but all that you know god wants to see in our life is do we have that heart am i you know striving am i trying am i committing myself to that kind of a life you know or am i living a careless life you know however i want i do i live less, live like a life like that or am i careful that is what you know god is more interested and secondly it talks about a wise and a just life 
you know, when I understand God's steward, I'll come back to the stewardship later. Let me, you know, uh, uh, to exhort here a little bit on a wise and a just life. Look at verse 8. What does it say? He must enjoy having guests in his home. He must love what is good. He must live wisely and be just. You know, let me quickly take you to another verse and then come back here. Ephesians 5, 15 to 17. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 17. I'm reading from NRSV here. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What does it mean to be wise and just? To be wise is to know understanding the will of God. To be wise in the, in the perspective of Bible is, it's about the wisdom of God. It's about the will of God. It's not, it's, it's not the way, you know, the world translates, the world defines wisdom or, you know, to be wise. You know, the world's understanding of wisdom and the world's understanding of being wise is completely different, right? You know, when somebody is cunning, you know, you would say that, you know, he's really, he's wise. But it's about understanding the wisdom of God, understanding the will of God, and then fulfilling the will of God. Okay, why should I do that? Because if I am, if I understand that I'm a God steward, what do I understand? That all that I have is, doesn't belong to me, it belongs to God. So now I need to know the will of God to use what God has given you and me. Amen. So you and I need to know the will of God. If you know the will of God, what happens? You'll accomplish the will of God. So you and I will not be using things according to our wish, according to our desire, but according to God's will. How does God reveal his will to us? By his word. As we study his word, as we listen to his word, you know, as he speaks, you know, he reveals his will unto us. And, you know, he inspires us so that we may use, you know, what he has interested according to his will, according to his desire, according to his mind. Because we understand we are God's steward. And not only that, what does a just person do? I want to come back. You know, see, look at the verse, making the most of the time because the days are evil. You know, he understands that the days are evil. You and I are living in evil times. Now, come back to uh, Titus now. And now look at verse 8 in this perspective. Look at verse 8. He must enjoy having guests in his home or eight words. Let me read it in uh, Inertia, but he must be hospitable, lover of goodness. You know, a just person is a hospitable person. Look at what's happening right now in this world. You know, we all are you know aware of what's happening in with, with Ukraine. You know, the things that are happening with Ukraine, the war that's going on right now. You know, praise be to God for those believers. Praise be to God for those churches. You know, who are actually you know uh, in in other countries like uh, Poland or Romania or Moldova, you know, and all those other neighboring countries were receiving those refugees. You know, those were actually being really hospitable. You know, that's a beautiful sign of, you know, of being a God steward, you know, because, you know, they are, you know, because they, un they understand that God has given me this influence or God has given me, you know, these, these, uh, this, this resources so that I can be hospitable. You know, you all may know that, uh, when the second wave hit India, you know, that there are a lot of, you know, migrants who had been poor laborers who are working in different parts of India, especially in the south of India. They, were, they walked for miles and miles and miles, you know, to reach their destination because no transport was available. They could not afford, you know, uh, uh, private vehicles. During this, those times, there were, you know, many of us, you know, that we were in a part of, you know, certain WhatsApp groups trying to help those people as they were crossing different states. It was not a work of one person, but it was work of different believers, various Christian believers across the states of India were connecting those, you know, migrant laborers, providing them food, providing them water, you know, sometimes in you know, the slippers, some warm, some clothes, all of that. Why am I saying this? The thing is, when a person understands that I'm a God steward, naturally, he would begin to live a wise and a just life. And as I said, he will begin to partake in the good work which God has prepared beforehand. Amen.
you know how you know how how beautifully all of this actually you know lines up aligns together you know this understanding of our identity as a god's steward you know it will it will it will reflect in our blameless life why do we live a blameless life because you know when paul writes to the uh, the church in corinth he says what does he say there we, let us who we live let us live for the one who has died for us says christ has died for us and so we will live let us die for christ to you know who died for us so we understand that a blameless lamb of god took our sins upon him and he died for uh, in, in our place as like a sinner and now i who a person who was a sinner will come into my life for that lamb of god to live a blameless life you know, just you know observe that you know what a beautiful truth that is what a beautiful revelation is that he who was blameless he became sinner for my sake he died in my place now i have received this new life this new identity and what am i going to do i'm going to commit myself to live a blameless life for the lamb of god for his glory amen as we strive for this blameless life for this holy life you know he will he will give us that necessary enablement he will give us the necessary the grace and the strength to go forward amen so number 2 is being a good steward god's steward and number 3 the the last identity the third identity that i want to show here is it's about being god's trustworthy we began with god's being god's elect move to god's steward now thirdly it's about god's trustworthy being a trustworthy person of god so that we may become fit for the good work that god has prepared for us read let me read verse 9 from uh, chapter 1 i'm reading from nrsv he must have a firm grasp of the word that is trustworthy in accordance with the teaching so that he may be able both to preach with sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict it okay it uh, the verse talks about teaching the word of god being a trustworthy person who handles the word of god in a right manner in a godly manner not giving into false teaching not you know uh, 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 no, uh, being in line with sound doctrine and at the same time when you look at being god's trustworthy i want to bring how does this reflect in our life and i want to bring three principles here three truths here which you will read which you can find from verse 8 to verse 16 you know the last section of the first chapter so let me you know show you those three uh, areas number one is when you understand that i'm called to be a trustworthy person by god you know the the, the beautiful part is he has not only made me his steward you know he has not only entrusted these things he is he trusts on me you know in fact you know uh, look at that word word itself in english you know being entrusted you know when some when something is given to you you call it as being entrusted even in that you know the word entrust itself there is this trust there so what does it actually means when i understand that god has given me something when something something is entrusted unto me you know it actually what does it say that god trusts me you know it's fine in fact it has to be found in everything you know when for example when somebody gives something to me something to you you know when when something is entrusted there is a trust involved in that you know in in a relationship you know in the resources in every area you know the responsibilities either be relationships or resources or responsibilities that there is something interested there is a trust part and now who is interested in these things to us it's god who is interested so and he who and he is faithful he is loyal he is trustworthy he calls you and me also to be loyal faithful and trustworthy okay how does it reflect in our life number 1 is by a devout life and number 2 through a disciplined life and number 3 through an exemplary life so let me uh, take a few minutes and expound on this i may not be able to talk you know expound completely but i will give these truths for you to you know munch on and you know read and meditate more uh, as you listen back to these uh, recordings may the lord you know speak to us number 1 a devout life what does he say let me read from verse 8 itself from uh, nlt rather he must enjoy having guests in his home 
you must love what is good you must live wisely and be just you must live a devout and disciplined life i'm reading from nlt he must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message he was taught then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it where they are wrong okay how is this devout life is reflected how does it reflect look at the ninth verse you must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message he was taught then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it where they are wrong a devout life is it starts with you and i believing this message you know being you know a uh, belief in the trustworthy message that was given to us that is not giving heed to deceptive message not giving heed to false teachings you know being very careful you know over and again i think i have emphasized on this uh, much but let me still you know repeat this there is so much of you know false doctrine out there so much of you know false teaching out there people go behind it so much that's why you see you know people coming for a bible study where a strong the right the truth and the word of god is is being taught or preached is very less but people throng you know go in large numbers behind you know people who actually you know would preach the false doctrine so we need to be very very careful that is what you know paul wants titus that's number one and also not only i you know heed you know those uh, trustworthy message the true the sound doctrine i will be also be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it where they are wrong okay unless i follow the right word of god the right teaching i will not be able to encourage others i will not be able to exhort others this is a devout life i practice it in my life the teaching i heed to that and also encourage others to follow that and also exhort others to you know and that is to be showing them where they are wrong amen so there's two responsibility here god trusts you and me my dear brothers and sisters with this that is i have given you this truth of the word of god are you heeding to that okay that is that's where you know i become a trustworthy person if i heed to the word of god if i heed to the truth of the word of god and also when i encourage others to be part of you know god's truth that is something which you know god uh, always says you know for example you know, my, my own life i've seen there are a few there are few godly leaders who i know or you know with whose uh, books i read i always you know i encourage people to read those books or listen to those those messages why because i know that because i have god has entrusted these truths unto me why why do i even teach the word of god because he has not only called me to teach the word of god but god is counting on me as a trustworthy person okay so it could be a it could be a small thing you know as even you know as passing on you know certain truths that you have received to another person in different forms but even in that even that could encourage another person that could exhort another person you no know, that could count as being trustworthy whatever god is calling us to do let us do that you know faithfully and exhort us and then you know let me read the other verse that now uh, look at words uh, verse 11 here verse 11 you know uh, they must be silenced because they're turning whole families away from the truth by their false teaching and they do it only for money this is very strong okay if not only you and i are called to show those believers those people where they are going wrong or you know following false doctrines all of that it talks also about those people who are teaching and preaching false doctrines false teaching what is they must be silenced you know can you know look at the gravity of the word that paul is using here they must be silenced they they no they must be made to shut up not to you know do what they're doing because they're turning whole families away from the truth by their false teaching how strong this is you know that is i cannot you know no longer continue to support or i cannot no longer continue to you know uh Uh, be indifferent to what these people are doing it shows you know silence them look at the gravity in which you know paul is writing these and also what is a devout life here look at verse 14 the 14th verse they must stop listening to jewish myths and the commands of people who have turned away from the truth again it's about a practice 
in the context of uh, the letter of Titus, there were certain Jewish Christians, you know, Christians who came from the Jewish background. They were pushing, you know, the Jewish customs and Jewish traditions, circumcision, all of that onto the new believers. So now Paul is saying they must be stopped. You know, they must not be, you know, they must not think that, okay, once he becomes a believer, you know, because he has put his faith in Christ, that is not the, that's not the end. These Jewish believers were, you know, thrusting upon the Jewish practice saying that, okay, you need to be circumcised, you need to follow these customs and traditions. And he says, these need not be followed. You know, so you see a devout life expressed in these ways. Number two talks about a disciplined life. What's a disciplined life? Let me just give you one verse here. Look at verse 10. Uh, no, how do, what is a disciplined life? Look at word, verse 10. For there are many rebellious people who engage in useless talk and deceive others. This is especially true of those who insist on circumcision for salvation. What are these people are doing? Engaging in useless talk, deceptive talk. Okay, so I'm called to live a disciplined life here, not to engage in useless talk, not to deceive others. Or also look at words uh, 12, verse 12. Even one of their own men, a prophet from Crete has said about them. It talks about the, the you know, the, the people of Crete. The people of Crete are all liars, cruel animals, lazy gluttons. So a disciplined life is where I'm no longer a liar. I speak the truth. I'm not cruel and violent. Rather, I'm gentle. I'm not lazy. I'm not a lazy glutton. But rather, I'm a one who puts in hard work. Okay, you see all of this, a disciplined life. And thirdly and finally, it talks about an exemplary life. Look at verse 15 and 16. 15 and 16. Everything is pure to those uh, to those whose hearts are pure, but nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving because their minds and consciences are corrupted. Such people claim they know God, but they deny him by the way they live. So when I understand that I'm, uh, I'm a God's trustworthy person, I commit my life to live an exemplary life. Not, not like as the verse says, they claim to know God, but they deny him by the way they live. But rather, I not only claim to know Jesus, not only claim to know God, but you know, through my life, I live a life that shows Christ. Amen. So when God trusts you and me, counts us to be trustworthy, when has given us a new identity, he's calling us to live a devout life, a life that heeds to the truth of word of God, encourages and exhorts others to follow the truth of God, not to go away from the sound doctrine, from the into false teaching. Number two, in my life, I'm called to live a disciplined life, not to engage in useless talk, not to, you know, get uh, involved in deception and, you know, not to, uh, you know, uh, turn away from the truth of word of God. And thirdly, to live a life that which is truly exemplary, you know, that is, doesn't claim that I know the, no, no God, no God's word and live different, but rather to live an exemplary life. Let me summarize and bring all of this, put all of this you know, together for us to you know, have an overall understanding. Uh, look at the slide. You know, I, I hope it will be helpful for you. Uh, we've been studying you know, this chapter on to be fit for good work. How does God prepare you and I to be fit enough you know, for the good work? Or whatever you know, the good work that is prepared before and how does he do that? When we understand this three you know, identity. When we understand the identity of being God's elect, number one, you know, understanding the identity of God's elect. Number two, understanding that you and I are called to be God's steward. And number three, when we understand that you and I have an identity of being God's trustworthy person. Because I'm a God's elect, chosen by God, I live by the principle of eternal life. I commit my life to live a godly life. And number two, when I understand that I'm a God's steward, I commit my life to live a blameless life, a wise and a just life. And number three, when I understand I am a God's trustworthy, God is trusting on me, I commit my life to live a devout life, a disciplined life, and an exemplary life. Uh, you know, may the Lord, you know, speak to us to, you know, to, to you know, take these truths very deep into our lives. As we understand these identities that God has given you and me, you know, this new identity that God has given you and me. And as we, you know, uh, these, these identities reflect in our life, you know, for this eternal life, godly life, blameless life, wise and just life, 
a devout life a disciplined life exemplary life as we you know uh, it reflects in all these areas of a life naturally automatically you and i will become part of the good work of god that he has prepared before us and let me close with a quote from uh, missionary hudson taylor in fact it's not only a quote on this day you know today on the march 1 and the 1st of march is when is we began the study of uh, paul's letter to titus on the same day in the year 1854 uh, hudson taylor reached the shores of china as a missionary on the same day on on and on that day you know as he reached when he recalls uh, his uh, you know he is uh, uh, the time when he when he landed on the shores of china to be a missionary there at 5 pm this is what he says uh, can look at the slide and you can see what does he says my feelings on stepping ashore i cannot attempt to describe my heart felt as though it had not it had not room and must burst its bonds while tears of gratitude and thankfulness fell from my eyes as he stepped on shore of china on this day same day in the evening at 5 pm the year 1854 to be to take the good news to take the gospel to those people in china when he reflects back this is what he says what does he say i cannot attempt to describe what you know my heart it felt that it had no room must burst in bonds you know, so much of joy tears of gratitude and thankfulness you know from fell from my eyes so here is a man who partook you know in the good works of god in the gospel work of god you know taking the great commission obeying the great commission and when he recalls that day you know on when he landed to fulfill the good work uh, to be part of god's great commission the work of the gospel he says you know my heart swear filled with you know her tears were filling uh, uh with, with the gratitude my ha- heart was filled with thankfulness uh, you know what a what a wonderful uh, sight this is you know adjun taylor had to face a lot of challenges so much of you know uh, there were you know the struggles that he had to go through he went through de- you know certain the de- 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 times of depression you know there were uh, dangers of shipwreck in fact those things that paul the apostle experienced he, he hudson taylor you know uh, faced those shipwrecks the same way so sometimes you know he 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 was separated from his family in fact his wife maria dyer died very young it was a very big support you know to him he had to you know be you know come away from his family his wife you know she passed away so much of things you know his own people insulted him his own people rejected him he faced all of that but he continued to be faithful in god's work and finally towards the end of his life you know this is what he says i want to close with that towards the end of his life this is the beginning of you know on this day the 1st of march he began and he says i'm i'm so grateful i'm so thankful that god has counted me you know to be worthy to be part of this good work that's that's the beginning and you know my dear brothers and sisters as a missionary for the last you know 21 years you know when i look back i can also say that on that day what a joy it was you know, to be a missionary to come to you know to be heart to north india to serve god but the question is what about today how am i now what is going to be you know in in the years to come is what you know uh, that's a beautiful lesson from hudson taylor look at what he says he almost comes to the end of his life this is what he says if i had a thousand pounds uh if if i had a thousand pounds china should have it if i had a thousand lives china should have them no not china but christ can we do too much for him can we do enough for such a precious savior what a beautiful thing it is you know when he comes to the end of his life also he says if i had a thousand pounds if i had a thousand lives uh, china should have them and he goes on to say it's not only it's not about china it's about christ what is he saying he says this is what he says can we do too much for him that is what you know i am trying to you know make this point here the good work whatever good work that god is calling you and me to be part to partake or to continue faithfully how can we do that is when we understand it is not about what what am i doing but it's about to whom am i doing amen yeah, and to whom am i doing it is to christ and that's what he says can we do 
too much for Christ? Can, can we do enough for such a precious Savior? When we look at that my life and the work that I do is not because of some person or some, some place or some ministry. No, it's because of Christ and Christ alone. And when I come to that understanding, and then I also understand the identity that I have in Christ of being a God select or being a God steward or being a God trustworthy person it begins to reflect in my life and I become a partaker of God's good work, which he has pre prepared beforehand. And, you know, a life brings truly glory unto his name. Shall we pray? Shall we look unto the Lord in prayer? What a beautiful, you know, day today. Shall we look unto the Lord in prayer? Father, we thank you, Father, for the wonderful truths that you have taught us, Master. Yes, Lord, your word is a delight. Lord, your word is a treasure. Your word is a truth that leads us every day, oh, Father. Thank you for, for helping us to understand that, Lord, that, that, Lord, that you have, Lord, saved us by your grace through faith for good works. And thank you, Lord, for showing the new identity that we have in you, O Master. And as we, Lord, Lord, allow these identities, Lord, in Christ to, Lord, completely, Lord, Lord, enter into our lives, O Father. Father, I pray it would reflect in all areas of our life as we study today. And let, through that, uh, help us to be, Lord, partakers uh, of the good work that you have prepared beforehand uh, for all of us, uh, Father, for your glory, for your kingdom's sake, O oh Master. Like Hudson Taylor, not only, Lord, in the beginning, even until the end, uh, let us have that same commitment, O oh Father. Thank you, Father, that, Lord, that we will be able to say, but whatever I may do, it will not be enough for my precious Savior. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Continue to speak to us. Encourage all of us uh, and help us, Lord, to be partakers of the good work for your glory. Thank you, Father. We come at us one second to your hands. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.